Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Onnit. Listen to me. I fly like a fucking animal, and I use Onnit fucking supplements in and out of airports. What's the one I... Shroom Tech Immune. Immune. Shroom Tech Sport. Fucking tremendous. As far as Alpha Brand, who else gives you fucking 100% money back guarantee and they don't want the product back? Nobody has that shit. That's why I love on it. That's why I fucking work with on it. That's why I've been with them for the last seven years. So do me a favor. If you want to get some great supplements, whether it's the uh, Mexican chocolate protein powder, the whey or gap, everything they got is solid. Go to onit.com and check out Press In Church. Bam! And get yourself 10% off delivered right to your fucking house. Who's better than on it? Nobody. Number two, I love this product right here. This is my new favorite friend on the road. Solojitsu.com. You're like, Joey, what the fuck is solojitsu.com? It's a deck of cards. And you just flip it over, and it tells you to do practice sprawls, and you practice sprawls. Then this one here is standing up the door pulled. It's just standing, you know. And then this one here, you bend it over, and you got fucking uh, bridge gr- bridges. This is it. This is a tremendous little fucking thing. You just, a little product. You're in your hotel room. You can do hip escapes. And you can do whatever it tells you. It's a solo game. You play by yourself. You smoke a bowl. Whatever you're into. Go to solojitsu.com and take a look. You're going to be fucking surprised. Kick that fucking mule leak. Kansas City's own fucking Chris Porter in the house. What up? What's up, beautiful? What's up? Thanks for having me, man. Oh, always a fucking pleasure. I, I just read about you every fucking weekend on Twitter that you destroy another room. And it's so weird how people just think you just showed up. Like, I love this about comedy lately. Like, people are like, yeah. where have you been? Where have I been? I, I started comedy when you were in grade school, you fuck. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, where, that's where I've been, motherfucker. Yeah, man. It's so crazy how people just think you just popped up. Dude, I, was, I did the comedy store the other night, and Rogan looked at somebody and goes, is he new? And I was like, fuck, dude. I've been here for like 10 years, man. But, yo, you changed. Yeah. You don't have that kid look to you no more. You no. had the little Jufro for a while. Yeah. No glasses. I got lo- yeah. yeah, yeah. Now you cut tr- it, so now you, you're respectable. I got, yeah, I look like an adult. You trimmed the beard. Absolutely. Yeah, you I got a girl it. that does it for me now. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's nice. So, no, I love And listen, it's really weird when you've been in this town for a while and you see comics, and we've all aged. We yeah. were kids when we got into this fucking game. Yep. We were kids kids when we got into this shit and all of a sudden now you see comics and they have families i knew greg Fitzsimmons when he was single you know <laughs> you know shit like that like yeah. maj jabrani before kids uh, brian cowan joe rogan for christ's sake yeah you know and those are the dudes that made yeah. it then there's a bunch of dudes back home back home that, that just were, had never made it out here because they had the kids too soon it's crazy i got a buddy i talked to him he came out and opened for me in shalon he's like i think i'm about done it's like i got two girls and it's like i don't know what to tell you man like you know it's it's rough for people to know the types of comics that are out there yeah. There's national touring headliners like Chris Porter and Joe Rogan, and people like that, Bill Burr. Then there's guys that are just regional, that maybe they have a job as a school teacher. Maybe, like, the, one of the best comics I've ever seen working is a guy out of Chicago. I forget what his name is. And uh, he, now he's on a radio show in Chicago. Yeah. But he never left because he had four kids and his, and his wife and him were school teachers or something. Absolutely. And, you know, I told somebody about him once. I go, dog, I opened for this guy in Myrtle Beach, and he destroyed the room. And the guy goes, is he about five foot eight? I think it was Jimmy Schubert who told me the story. Yeah. Jimmy Schubert goes, bro, let me tell you a story about that fucking dude. Because <laughs> the dude has a joke about a bus driver, about the, oh, yeah, we got some. And he's a white dude, but he does like a black bus driver, and he breaks down every candy they have for the day. This is 20 years ago. Yeah. We got Juju Bees, we got M&M's, we got... It was a joke that went something like that, but it was just a brilliantly written joke. Like, you sit there as a comic and go, wow, I'm really watching, like, good comedy. I was doing comedy, like, eight years, nine years, and this guy's, like, a fucking pro. And when you saw those... and You know, when we were in comedy doing eight, nine years, when you saw those guys, you're like, wow, I'm never be that good. Absolutely. It's really weird that this guy... Uh, I was telling Schubert about him, and Schubert goes, bro... Years earlier, when Kennison was alive, it, the rule was when Kennison played your town, 
he was coming to the late show at the com at you know, that comedy club. So if he did a theater in Kansas City, yeah, he would shoot to the improv for the second show. Yeah, and the owner would tell you, listen, that people called on Friday. <laughs> Saturday we're gonna pay you. As soon as we give you the light, get the fuck off. Kevin oh, absolutely. Go up on stage. We're gonna pay you. Just don't worry about it. Don't it's like when you... Chappelle would show up to the punchline right, yeah. back in the day. Yeah, like yeah. don't let your ego bother you. Yeah, here's your just, money. This is your money. Just go home. Have fun. You know, Enjoy have your fun. paid week yeah. off. So, so supposedly they told this kid, Kennison in town, and Kennison came in. He saw Kennison and started speeding through his material, and Kennison goes, no, don't give him the light. This kid's killing me. Yeah. Kid got on stage. And Kenneth didn't even follow him. Kenneth no, Kenneth and I said, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. You have to come on the road with me. And the kid's like, I can't. Yeah. I have three oh my kids. God. I'm a teacher. You know, shit like that. Absolutely. That story is just like that, dog. There's a guy, one my favorite comic work is Chad Daniels. And I and he's getting his due for the most part, I think. But I think that guy would be humongous. But he lives in the middle of bumfuck Minnesota. He has to drive two hours to get to the airport, I think. But, you know, he's just a good family man. And he's like, he wants to be around his kids and shit, but probably the funniest dude working right now. I would I don't knock those guys. Yeah? Because they knew exactly what they wanted yep. from the very beginning. When I started in Denver, there was two or three different types of comics. There were comics that wanted to be stars, Steve McGrew. There were comics that just did triple runs and kept it local and had a day job, played it safe, maybe had a girlfriend. And then there were comics who were reckless. You know, the ones that you look at and you know they're doing comedy just as an excuse to drink and party. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. And get pussy. You see them. You, you smell them a mile away. You know, like that's. Well, I, mean, I, I think the really good comics run through all three of those phases. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you do. Yeah. You, you, you really have to find. That's why it takes 20 years. That's why it takes 18 years. Yeah. That's why it takes 16 years. Or Dude, I love years. it when a comic that's been doing it four years goes, I found my voice. Oh, I laugh my I'm ass off. I'm just like, okay. I know exactly what point you're at. Yeah, well, absolutely. By, just by talking to a comic now from doing yeah. it for so long. Yeah. Like, I know where you're at. Like, I know that you kill. Then listen, you have no fucking idea. Yeah. You found you a voice. You have no idea, and you don't want to put yourself in a position where, because it'll be traumatizing. Yeah. It's like going to Vietnam at 16 and seeing 22 dead fucking people were shooting themselves in the head. That's how traumatizing <laughs> it is when you get somewhere where you don't need to be or something like that. There's a pattern and there's a system and there's a formula. And that formula has worked for 2,000 fucking years. And guess what? I've seen that formula work. And I've seen everybody have a different formula. I remember people going to me. I, don't even, I remember this kid from acting class once. Came to the store saw me and like this is 98 yeah 99 i had been doing comedy maybe nine years and he saw me like the next acting class he's like i could do what you could do and i remember even then looking at him going like at that time i just came off that bombing in buffalo yeah like i had this life-changing <laughs> bombing okay like we all have these bombs oh absolutely along the way that you remember like you have a bomb at the fourth year that's traumatizing there was a bombing i took at a at a buffalo at a bar and it was a buffalo saber game at halftime that was the dip that was the, the the gig okay you did halftime of the buffalo saber game they just i didn't know it was just a place where they threw you it was like gladiator oh that's it was like burr in philadelphia yeah it was like Burr in Philadelphia, but Burr knew what he was going into when he attacked them. Yeah, he'd seen like four people already get eaten. I didn't know what to do, was, so I what, got attacked. Yeah, you know, so is there, like, because Burr in Philadelphia doesn't seem like a bomb to me. No. Like he almost had, it was like He almost, went reverse, and that was what made it brilliant. Okay. He didn't let himself bomb. <laughs> he went up there knowing nothing he could do. Yeah. That's very strong when you look at an audience and go, you know what? <laughs> There's nothing I could do with these savages. It's like when you get yourself involved in those midnight shows. Remember those? Oh, you absolutely. You open up your mouth and, I'll do a midnight show. And their fucking puke is coming out of their eyeballs. People Yo. are passing out. Yeah. And you're bombing going, why did I get myself <laughs> involved in a midnight fucking show? Yeah. Like those, remember years, 20 years ago, the midnight show had just come out and it was always late. It started at a quarter to one. You're Maybe dead. you're lucky. You're dead. You're dead. Yeah. You're dead. They've been standing and that, late. And then the host would go 20 because he's it. hammered. Yeah, he, you're dead. Those late, they had to do away with them. The improvs did away with them because the comics even said it. By the by, the second show, some nights, you don't know, after, especially on a Tuesday, 
when you go to work on a Tuesday and work, and it's my Saturday, <laughs> you don't know what's coming out of your mouth. You don't even know where you're at. Three shows on a Saturday. The second show, you're like, did I say this already? Dude, I opened for Tracy Morgan like 13 years ago at the West Palm Improv, and he was doing hour 30. And they'd still have me do 30 in front of him. And so I think the Midnight Show actually started at 145. So I went on at 2. Those shows didn't even get over till 4. Like, it was insanity. It was insanity. Have you said a joke multiple times in the same set ever? Oh, they'll tell you. Oh, no, you see it on their face immediately. immediately. The 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 curtain has been lifted. No, so that's what I'm saying. So you've done it before. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. But you get four words in and you can just feel it. It's like <laughs> it's like you said abortion. Like you just, it fucking gets sucked out of the room. Oh, my God. It's terrible. You have no idea. The, the journey, I sip like, uh, the main question I want to ask every comic in this room that comes in here from now on, so young comics that are listening, is at the four-year mark, did you have that epiphany? I tell, well, as comics, we have that the first five years, every six months, you ask yourself, am I doing the right fucking thing here? Is, is this. Uh, no, because I, I think four years in, I was kind of on the road. Like, you I was already start, featured? I was starting to work I had already featured. Yeah. The first time, my four, yeah. Yeah, four years in, I was already featured. Like, it, what? listen, when you start in Kansas City, it's not hard. If you're a little bit funny and <coughs> kind of cute and you can carry 25 minutes, you're going to get a lot of work. And I think that's what I learned very early is that, and no offense to the people that struggle, but for me, being funny was kind of easy. It was like, it was trying to have a point of view. Right, right. We're issue. all funny. Yeah. Everybody who gets on a stage Absolutely. has to have a slight angle of confidence that they said or did something that they thought was funny at one time yeah like i didn't start realizing it like people would tell me but i didn't really start realizing it like about a month or two before i got arrested yeah was when I'm like maybe i'm on to something maybe these guys are right but now come on me yeah. i do blow i fuck but then tim allen got arrested for coke and <laughs> yeah richard Pryor lit himself on fire so I was like, well, these are all promising yeah. things for a guy that these doesn't are all like promising cocaine. fucking thing. Yeah, and then I got locked up in the prison library. Had ladies and gentlemen, Lenny Bruce. Okay, and I was telling uh, Brent this our jujitsu guy the other day uh, after the comic show. I went to his house to watch the fights, and I was telling him, I go, you know, you. I read that Lenny uh, Bruce book, and I was like, wait a second. So this guy works at a strip club. And goes in between strippers. Right there. That sounds yeah. pretty much fun. Then he goes home to the Chelsea Hotel. A hotel. That's fun right there. Living in a hotel. That's a fucking blast. And he hangs out with jazz musicians and other strippers who come back to the hotel. They live there too. And they shoot heroin. And they sleep all fucking day. And then get up at 7 or 8, eat dinner, and go do comedy at night. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> like I was like, I could pretty much handle that. Yeah, that's what I was built to handle. Seriously, but that that's sad, Chris. Yeah. That that's the that's all I thought I could do at twenty eight. I'm like, I could do that. I but, could shoot a little heroin. But did some, you had you done heroin? At, did you realize yes. how this? Oh, okay. So yeah, you yeah, knew how destructive knew, it was. At that time, I had snorted heroin maybe once. Yeah, twice. But that's a way different thing than putting it into your brain. right. No, no, I wasn't. Gonna, I wasn't going to shoot heroin. No, no, yeah. I don't like needles. Yeah, that's what so I was saying. I was, I was just going to do a couple bumps at night. Yeah, what I, I, I just want to be part of something that wasn't part of something. You wanted to be a pirate. Like I wanted to be. Yeah, like I, I wanted to be a boy scout until I joined. Yeah, and I'm like there's too many fucking rules. Yeah. Yes. And then when I was a kid, you know, maybe I could be an associate in the mob family. Too many fucking rules. You know, it was just everything I wanted to do had always too many fucking rules. This was the only thing that really had no rules. Like, there's no rules. Yeah, you just show up. You, you say what you want to say. Yeah. You do what you want to do. Yeah. And there's no rules on either side either. You no. Know, and then they come to you one day when you're doing comedy four years and go, hey, man, if you keep doing that type of material, you'll never be on Letterman or Leno. And right there, you have to decide. Yeah. You know what? Fuck it. I'd rather be myself. Yeah, these... say fuck than not be on. That's big decisions when you're a comic that you have to make it the fourth or fifth year. 
or go, you know what, I could work a clean set alternate. There's a lot of great guys like you that could do a clean fucking set. I can't do a clean set if you paid me. So what like what do you guys cuz there's a few different levels of of when you say dirty, like they're swearing and all that, but something I've noticed uh since I've started is people who are like I don't know if you call it shock or whatever you want to call it where it's like they're just saying things that don't even I don't think if you wrote them down would be funny but they're trying to get a groan or well you don't weird. have a point of view okay so your point of view is to go up there and shock people there's no point of view yeah. some audiences will laugh at the I can't believe he just said that okay you know what I'm saying very few of them but like stone frat boys will laugh at that shit and you don't know how many times I've seen dudes go up on stage and do something and you go oh I, I know what happened <laughs> you said this shit when you were high around your stoner ass friends last night and it killed so you remembered what you could and now we're on stage we're hearing it and we're not high <laughs> and we're not your friends and none of this shit's really fucking that's funny. fucking crazy that's yeah i've done that a thousand times we all have absolutely we all have that's crazy you just find yourself going oh may, there's there's something i didn't say and that's it's wild because i mean as a com- comedian i'm trying to, i like to make people laugh i'm i don't know because joey said something to me a couple weeks ago that i've really been not struggling with but thinking about he said that i should try to work clean at least a little bit at the beginning and i don't see myself as dirty but there's a couple jokes that i do that talk about sex and i don't it's kind of because there are no rules it's kind of hard to know does that count as dirty can i not talk about sex at all it's like it's i'm trying to figure out what's allowed my advice to young comics is to write clean Cause you're you're gonna say fuck because it's your natural person. So if you write fucks and then you get nervous and you say more fucks, that's double fucks. So and then that gets too many fucks. So like, I say write clean. Remember the bits clean. So can you talk about sex at all or no? Is that, oh yeah, that dirty. I'm, I'm talking about like well, hold curse on one words. second. Hold on one second. You could talk about whatever the fuck you talk about as long as you know what the fuck you're talking about and you have conviction. Would you would you eat a woman's asshole? No. Then then, then don't talk about sex because yeah. you have no right to. You won't eat a woman's asshole, so you have no idea about sex. That's just why I told you don't talk about sex. You've never come. You dated a girl for four years and refused to come in her mouth. You bought into the fact that she didn't like morning sex. Wait. So you can't talk about sex because you're not a sexual person. And why aren't you talking about those things yeah. on stage? That's the funniest thing in That's the world. The fun- I've ever heard Four in my years life. you never came in, came in the mouth? mouth? It's fucking ridiculous. Ridiculous. Fucking, even on yeah. accident. Oh, no. You think odds are. It's ridiculous. So he's not a sexual dude. It's like me kind of going going on stage and talking about computer nerd shit. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a computer nerd, bro. I don't know nothing about that shit. I don't even know what the URL is. Nor do I want to know. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I don't know nothing. You got to so, so you, you have, should be talking about how you're not a sexual person. I well, I guess I don't want to. I mean, I'm not going to do jokes, but I think it's more like my because I'm I I had years of girls who even before my ex, I had multiple exes who just were into it, but not really into what blowjobs. So, you know, no, blow, they would tell them when I well, but I had it, one girl say, yeah. "Don't go down on me because I'm not going down on you." That was the worst. I didn't. That's, I didn't see end of that relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was it. That was yeah. it. But you attract that. That's he attracts half, that. I, oh, you do. He attracts that because he doesn't Cause set the rules in the beginning. Yeah, I'm. I'm learning and that's to something now. Something that you learn along the way. But yeah. But back to the comedy. For me, with him and anybody else, like when I started, I didn't write, Chris. I didn't write. The first year, I didn't write. I went up there, and I thought I could just. I thought it was just showing up. Yeah. And I bombed all the time. And then I got a job as a house MC. And I started writing, but I realized something. That it was the same people every week. So every week I had to write a new five minutes. What an education that was. Yeah. And every week I died to slow that. Once in a fucking while. I still remember using props, guys. Remember when Madonna <laughs> Vogue? Yeah. When they had the cones on their tits? Oh, absolutely. I came out with cones one night. Like, I had tried everything. You're talking to a man that used to walk up on stage to a rap song and say, hey, everybody, you ready to have a good time? And they go, yeah. I go, you ready to have a really good time? Say, hell yeah. They go, hell yeah. I go, all right, let's get naked. And I took off my shirt, and I was super skinny. And, of course, no one took off their clothes, so it would get weird. And then uh, I'd go, oh, okay. Well, you guys kind of bailed on that. So here's my impression of a greyhound. And then I would get up on the stool, and I would suck in, and all my ribs would show. And... I would look like a greyhound. Like, that was my opener. 
So, like, I totally get fucking a strong open with weird shit and a music cue. You're just finding your way. Yeah. It's years. It's years. You know, and I'll never forget this guy going to me like, "Uh, yeah, I'm going to do what you do. And then a fucking week later, I saw him. He said he got a showcase from Montreal. Yeah. He was doing a set at the Black Club on Wilshire that's still there. But nobody talks about it. Comedy Union? Yeah. It's, oh, it's on Pico. Pico. Yeah. Nobody talks about it no more. Nobody. Well, no, none of, none of the white people. Yeah, but not, nobody. Even black people. I don't have oh, fuck it. I was talking to Jackie Famous about it the other night. Really? Yeah, she yeah. goes down there? She goes down there, yeah. Like, it's the weirdest thing. Like, I was... I, I don't even know what the fuck we're talking about being down there. About weird openers? Finding your voice? I don't even fucking... <laughs> it's just uh it, it takes so long and it oh he got a, a union uh that's what it was that kid went down there to the open mic oh, and yeah. somebody from montreal gave him a showcase his third time on stage and he called me up um, on the on my twitter on my uh pager and i go what's up and he goes bro how long you been doing comedy for he, i go nine years he goes i've been doing comedy three times and i'm already going to montreal Oh yeah, God. well, that guy's gonna just oh. fucking sabotage his listen career before he even me. knows uh, it. Listen to me, you don't know. You don't. This is the beginning. Yeah, he died a bag of death. Never went <laughs> to Montreal. Then he opened up a restaurant up here. Yeah, he took his family savings, his wife's, and he opened up a restaurant. And they would do comedy in the back patio. And he was the house MC, and he was trying to get people, but he wanted clean comedy. He didn't believe in dirty. Like that's why he hated me. He didn't like dirty comedy, and he opened that up, and that died a slow death. And he's back in New York, fucking uh, as a waiter or some yeah, shit. Yeah, about five dude. years ago. He's a yeah, swing I, manager I, at the I, Fridays. I love when people come up to me, and they're doing comedy five years, and they're telling me what they're doing, and I'm like, I know what you're doing. I've been there. You can't even open up your fucking mouth. So you're doing comedy eight or nine years. You, you don't even know, you don't even say a fucking word. I was doing the I did Tommy Chong comedy at four twenty for Showtime, and it was like the worst experience ever. Just because we showed up, it was 118 degrees in San Bernardino where we shot it. Oh my god! Our hotel room, the, the fucking air conditioning was broken, so it was like 85 degrees in our hotel room. And I brought this girl with me who'd been doing comedy for a little bit. Right before I went on stage, Tommy, by the way, had pneumonia. Like, we're at pre production. He's on a cot shivering. Oh my God. Like, not making words. And we're like, we're all looking at each other like, we're not going to do this, right? And they're like, no, we, you know, we, you know, there's like a hundred grand into this production. We have to do it. So. And also this audience, it's like the third thing they've saw. Like Jay Moore did a special, Ian Bag did a special, and then we were the third thing. This is a Montoya special. Yeah. Yeah, this is Scott Montoya special. So uh, first comic goes out, does fine. Second comic goes out. His his mic cuts out for eight minutes. Shelby goes out. And I don't know if you've ever seen Shelby Chong do comedy, but it's, it's, it's rough. And it's like. Is that a daughter or a wife? That's his or wife. Oh. That's his wife. It's it's tough. Uh, so then Tommy goes out, and he's about 18 minutes into a set and walks off stage mid-sentence. Doesn't say a word. He has to go throw up. The director comes out. He could have said a lot of things. Like, oh, Tommy's fucked up, man. Tommy had too many cookies. He's got to just chill out for a second. No, he didn't say that. What he said was, Tommy Chong is deathly ill, and he's going to the hospital. So the audience starts standing up, getting ready to leave. Guess who's next, by the way? Me. And so they have to, like, corral the audience back. I go out on stage. The first eight minutes of my set is unusable. They're just staring at me. And you know how tapings, the audiences are lit. So you're just, you're looking at these people look at you. And so you're just... Finally, I got him. I did 20 minutes. Like, the last seven minutes was TV passable. Get off stage. I get back to the to my dressing room, and this girl's like, so I have some notes. I go, are you fucking kidding me? She said, I thought you might want notes from a peer. 
And I looked at her. I said, there better be a fucking eye in that word. You better be talking about a place where we park boats. Because you have been doing shit for fucking five years. There's, we're not peers. Like, you're just a girl that's done comedy for a little bit. And also, I know I just ate a bag of dicks. I don't need to fucking go over it with a fine tooth comb. It's, no, no, no. I know exactly. You know, you've been doing it for so long. Yeah. You know exactly I know where the pieces I know just what fall. happened. I know, you know, it's when I did this Netflix thing. I knew when I got on stage where I went wrong. Yeah. How I prepared for it the wrong way. Like, you just... But this is part of the fucking journey. Yeah. And you look in the mirror. You man up. You take that notebook out. You get the feather. You get some chicken blood. <laughs> and you start writing. Yeah. And then you get on fucking stage. And that's it. Yeah. And you... There comes a point where you fall in love with it. Like this morning, I called in for spots at the store at 901. There was nobody there. Yeah, you know yeah, saying? no. But you can that, call it 1030 when they're supposed to be there. But that means there. that you're back. Yeah. I went back to my open mic days. Remember when they said, if you want to be on an open mic, get a call Tuesdays at 3? Yeah. You made sure you called at 250 fucking 9. I remember going to open mic in Kansas City. The show started at 830. We'd be there at 5. Hanging out, we grab dinner, and we just sit there and write for fucking. Where'd two. you start at? Started at Stanford and Sons in Westport. So they what like year was this? Ninety eight. So the open mic was on Sundays. The open mic you can't. Our open mic was Mondays. So I'd go to work, go to college, come in, and then I'd come straight to the open mic, and we'd be there. You know, especially initially when Emory Emory ran that open mic. Uh, there'd be like a we'd be there an hour and a half beforehand like people would go up rehearse their sets and they'd get notes and like people would try to tag it it was a very communal atmosphere and uh, but it, and but at the very least you got to go up there and run shit before you actually did the show alright so Stanford and Sons had how many clubs at that time just the one okay so when I got into comedy in 91 in 92 I dated a girl who was from Lawrence, Kansas. Go Hawks. And I drove home with her to watch her. You drove home with her to what? I drove home with her to Lawrence. Oh, okay. She was from Lawrence, but then she went to Jayhawk. And we went to watch them play. And then we drove on a Sunday night for me to do an open mic at Stanford and Sons. And the guy had the guy that ran the room then wasn't Emory Emory. It was somebody else, if you say his name. But this is 1992. Yeah. You were a kid. I, I absolutely was. And I went up there. I thought I was hot shit. They gave me six minutes. It was just brutal. <laughs> and I remember I bombed in front of her, her mother, like her fucking stepmother. Oh, they brought the family out to watch you? You have no choice. People to invite themselves. Yeah. Oh, they're like, oh, you're doing comedy. They invite themselves. You know, the mother didn't like me. The stepfather had a wig. Everybody had a fucking wig in her family. Her stepfather and her real father both had wigs. Yeah. How crazy is that? Well, once Grandpa's pulling it off, yeah. like, I got it. And she was a waitress at the comedy club. She was a waitress at the bar where I did comedy on Tuesdays. So she kind of knew where I was in my comedy career. I was just, you know, it was just a Tuesday night for me. They paid me 50 bucks and fed yeah. me. And I sold pills there. I sold Valium. So I would make people come up there. They would pay to come see me. They would go, oh, you have a draw. No. Nah. I'd make them fucking come up. You know, it was just such a scam I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> but that year was such. Like, I would just do Tuesdays. I wouldn't do the comedy works. I yeah. would just do the Boulder Broker on Tuesdays. And then Saturdays, I would drive to, like, fucking an hour to get on this place that was huge. And i just go bomb. It was like a bowling alley in Denver. At 11 o'clock. That was my repertoire. Yeah. And then I started getting guest sets at McKelvey's, and I would just bomb. Bomb, bomb, man. What a fucking... It was horrible. I had nothing else going on, so it was like, who cares? I just keep bombing. I've heard, I've heard a lot of negative things about starting comedy in L.A., but the one thing I'm very grateful for is how many open mics I have. Oh, like, yeah. I, I have tons of open mics. Like I've I've been very spoiled, so I've been going to one mainly, 
And last night I went with another buddy of ours, Eric, who was just on the podcast. And we tried three that I'd never done before. And it was you had to wait at the bar for like two hours. It was <laughs> it it wasn't as easy as just going to the fourth wall, but it was fun. I enjoyed having the one show a week when, especially starting, because it like gave. You spent all week looking forward to that one. Like, that was your show. That was your show. That was my... I wouldn't sleep on Monday nights. Oh, yeah. Or Sunday nights. No, I would I would do, do my the- to, my Tuesday night. Oh, yeah. My Tuesday night. I would stay up on Monday night and write. My friend was a baker, and he would take Tuesdays off, so he would stay up all night Monday and bake, and I would taste all the ice creams and gelatins and all the fucking parfaits he made. I'd <laughs> stay there with him drinking coffee all night, writing jokes. Yeah. It, and I would not sleep. It was, it was, you just looked for, like, that was your night, too. Like, all it was like your club. It, you'd go there, all your friends were there by that, especially if you'd been doing open mic for more than a year. Like, most of your friends were those people. So it was like, it was equivalent to, like, going to, like, a recreational softball game. You know, you're just like, your team's there, you guys are ready to do it, you're hoping to win, have a good night. And, you know, some nights you didn't. Some nights you did. How long did it take Stanford and Son to... Now, what are the clubs went close to you at that time? It was just Stanford and Son. It's just Stanford's, and it was That's just it. Westport. And then... But the cool thing was, like, you could go up to Omaha two and a half hours and do an open mic or St. Louis. And so... And that's what was cool about, like, we, you couldn't send anyone links. You'd have to, like, make a VHS or... And that shit was expensive. So we would... Uh, like four of us would drive up to Omaha and do an open mic, and then one of us would try to stay sober enough to drive back. And I, I honestly don't know how some of us made it home without DUIs or just long trails into a cornfield, especially driving back from Omaha. Like we just hammer drunk. The memories that. Like there's memories in my life of like I had you know a baseball game or like Joe Namath football camp, but those first ten years of comedy, they're fucking edged in my mind, priceless forever. And there was a lot of hard times, like from shitting on a window in <laughs> Seattle in, the, in, a, in an office like this. I would just get up in the middle of the night and go to the hallway and shit out the window, and you know because it was an office with no bathroom. Yeah. To just. Like, I, I can't even describe it. Like, that that journey is so fucking unique, and you have to do it. You have to do that journey. That whole, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow journey. Yeah. Like, you have no idea. Like, this is it. This is it. Like, we got three weeks worth of gigs. We got $16. And this is it. I remember being in Wisconsin doing these one-nighters. For what was her name up there that booked the comedy cafe? She booked Marquette University. Oh, I don't remember. And then no, she gave was, it to her daughter. This was a dude. I think this dude's name was Hanson or something. Tom Hanson. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That so was- I show up to this gig and like 99 times out of 100, if you want to advance, you just show up and like, hey, uh, can I just, after you do the show, you're like, hey, can I get some cash on Hold the on. work I just did? Well, this was like a bar where they like had contracted the workout. I was new to this whole concept. And they're like, no, we don't. I'm like, I have $18 and 200 miles to get. Like, I don't have enough money for food and gas. So if I don't have any cash and dude had to wire me money. Like, I remember just going back to the hotel room, calling the guy that booked the thing for me. Being like, I need something. Or like, I'm literally stuck in. But whatever the fuck Wisconsin I am right now, eighteen, you know, because I'm literally, I thought I was going to get paid after this. And they're like, nah. All those guys I took to the premiere of The Longest Yard at one time or another borrowed $200 from each of them. I told them all that I needed $200 at one time or another. And they all told me the same thing. This is not a loan. This is a gift. This is an investment in your future. Yeah. Don't ask again. I would buy a gram of Coke. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. At least $50 worth of Coke. And I'd use the other money. And those are the guys that would send me the hundreds. And they would say, I put 200 in there. Don't ask again. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I put 200 in there. Don't even, I, would, I don't even want it back. 
<laughs> really want it back, but don't call back here again looking for money. <laughs> like I had people who really that's what you do. That's yeah. what you do when you get into comedy. You you have a support group around your people, you know, and again, if you trust the universe, these people will come to you and some nights they got ten bucks and some nights you got ten bucks. Dude, I remember uh right after we had filmed Last Comic Standing, but it hadn't come out yet. So, you know, you get all your TV money when it airs. And I was fucking... I got to this college thinking they were... Again, thinking they were going to pay me a lot of money. And uh, they uh, they were like, oh, no, we sent it to your man. We sent it to your agent. You'll get it in like two weeks. And I had to borrow $100 from Christian Finnegan. I'd be like, hey. Like just straight up, like, hey man, I thought we were getting paid. We're not. If you give me a hundred bucks, I'll make sure you get it back. And then I had to like call the agency and be like, take a hundred dollars from my check, put it on his check, because he gave it to me. And I and still, whenever I see Christian Finnegan, I buy him a beer for that shit. Because I, you know, that was just another time where, you know, especially oh five, like you weren't, cell phones weren't huge at that point. The internet definitely wasn't, so you were just fucked. Especially when we started cell phone. I didn't have a cell phone when I started. Definitely didn't have GPS. I remember buying an Atlas every year. I didn't have a cell phone until 2004. I was the last guy on the block. And Sprint gave me a $200 a month credit because of my bad credit. And yeah. If I was $201, they shut me down. You know how many mornings I got up and my phone was shut off. When I go down there, they'd say, you're all $1.34. Mm -hmm. And I go, you got to be fucking shitting me. <laughs> so I would just pay $40 every time, you know, and then I just built it up. And then one day they said, you have no credit. Like, it was crazy. But I borrowed money constantly. Like, I be that's how I became friends with Ari Shafir. I needed a plane ticket, and I looked at him, and I go, dog, I need $200. And I'll get it to you in two days, and I gave it to him. And he goes, I thought I'd never see it again. Yeah. People were pissed at me for giving it to you. They said, you were a coke <laughs> fiend. And I go, no. I did that shit for years. Now I need all the friends I can get, you know? <laughs> and it's just weird. Like, that's what you do. You just, uh, it just happens. Every month, you just barely make it for a few years. But that that's part of the toughness that you need for this shit I'm going through. That toughness you develop yeah. is what gets you through the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th year. When you come out here and now you're going on auditions. Yeah. And now you're dealing with that. All that stuff all contributes to that. That's what people never see. They try to skip that. Can't skip it. It's like Penzor. You can either pay me now or you can pay me later. But you're going to pay me. Yep. You're going to pay me this money. I don't give a fuck what you think or what they told you or what you expected. But you have to do this to become this. Because if not... There's going to be so many fucking holes in your game. I was doing comedy. I was a regular at the store, and I had been doing comedy nine years. And I had a little bit of a head. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I'm like, I might not be in Montreal, and I might not have a deal, but I'm following Paul Mooney every night, bitches. And in my world, that means a lot more than what the fuck you're doing. And I had a little bit of an ego, and it had to be probably February of 99. When I was starting a headline, I was a horrid headline. Horrid. Horrid. They were putting me in headline position. Yeah. Horrible. You do like five minutes of fire. Yeah. 15 minutes of shit. Horrid. Horrid. Five horrid, minutes horrid. of fire. Yeah. You know. You're just I'm stringing just, a bridge, basically. Horrible. Like, just fucking. It's, uh, and you think, like, you're really fucking good. And I got a spot on Freaky Monday. Did you ever get to do Freaky Monday? I don't know what that is. Freaky Monday was at the Improv from about 97 till about 2003 or 4. Before it, was, it went the Urban Night? It was it was the Urban Night, but they were very smart in those days. Yeah. From 8 to 8.40, it was white. So it would be you from 8 to 8.10, Josh Wolf from 8.11 to 8.21, me and then they would put a super hot white guy, yeah. Pablo, Doug Stanhope, yeah, and then they would bring the black axe, 
they would, you know, and then it would be by by nine thirty was all black. That's it. You could see the white leave the room. <laughs> it was fucking ridiculous because the industry was up there. Like in those days, if you got on stage on Freaky Monday, Fat Tuesday, Latino Night at the Laugh Factory, you got an agent, you got a gig, you got approached. People would talk to you. There wasn't that much computer. People would have to come out and see you. Yeah. It wasn't that there wasn't that much streaming yet. So when you would do those rooms, people would come out. And one Monday, I moved myself up. You know, I started freaking Monday at the four. First, they had a, a six-minute spot. And if you did okay for the six-minute spot, then they give you like an eighth. Yeah. Then they give you like a tenth. And every week, they missed it up. And, 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 and it was pretty weird. Like, that, if you got a triple crown, that used to be the old Monday thing. If you did Latino night... Freaky Monday, and then you did a spot at the comedy store, which is the open mic that was a triple crown. <laughs> One o'clock in the morning, you're walking into the comedy store like, what, bitches? I'm doing a triple crown tonight, motherfuckers. So I, I never forget following. I went down there, and they said somebody canceled. And they go, we have a spot for you. And I had to follow Stanhope and bring up the Apollo. And I thought I was pretty fucking good. Like, I thought at that time, honesty, honestly, guys, at the eight, nine month, nine year mark, I had a pretty killer 30. Yeah. I could rock six fucking minutes, good, high energy, fucking, oh my God, Stan Hope took it to another level. I went up there and ate a bag of dicks. And then Nick DePaulo went up there and ate a, and destroyed the room. Which made my confidence feel, you know, and I didn't belong there. That's it. I was in the spot where I saw myself going, Oof. A lot of people wouldn't have said that. A lot of people would go, that's nothing. The sound wasn't right or they're black. They don't like me or whatever. No. I was like, something didn't work out there. That's not supposed to be. And I think the next week I was on the road. Like, that's it. That's it. This yeah. is not going to ever, ever happen again. I'm going to make sure that this never, ever happens again. And I went on a two-year Greyhound flight, Amtrak, whatever. I would leave with six weeks and put together 28. Really? Yeah. Don't ask me how. I would leave with El Paso, Miami Improv, Myrtle Beach, the One Club. Uh, John X would give me the DC Improv. Okay. John X would give me like one night the DC Improv. I would just go up to Eastern Border, Philadelphia, nothing. New Jersey would give me a uh, one night at Rascals and East Orange or the other one. Uh, there was a room in Syracuse, Wise Guys, Steve Sharippa, well, Bruno Sharippa. He liked me and he would give me two weeks. Toronto had a room that was run by a magician <laughs> that didn't pay. It was six hundred a week American to headline. Two weeks, but Mitch Hedberg did it. Yeah. So I said when they offered it to me, I go, Mitch <laughs> Hedberg did it. I did it. It was brutal. You stayed over the club. Oh, it was shit. two weeks. One week you were in downtown Toronto, and the other week you were in the suburbs. The guy that ran the club was an old school Russian Jew, <laughs> Boris. Yeah. And Boris's brother. So Boris would run the downtown club, and that was cool. There was a bar underneath. It was called. Uh, Toronto Wood. <laughs> like Toronto Wood Comedy Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was right downtown. It was 600 a week. It was like Tuesday through Saturday. And fucking the, the following week, they would put you in the suburbs, in his suburb room. And that sucked. And his brother was a driver for a hooker service. Like, you can't write this shit. Yeah, yeah right? Like, you can't write this shit. So as soon as you got there... The first thing the brother would say, first of all, you shared a room with the brother. Oh, no. Oh, I hate that So shit. you were in this room with this chubby guy that smelled like salami that could not get laid. <laughs> and what he did was drive hookers around on Friday and Saturday from midnight to 8 in the morning. So you'd wake up at 8 in the morning, and he'd be sitting on the bed eating like a sub five feet from you. It was brutal. Oh, uh. Guys, this dude, is brutal. Dude, I remember Stanford's back in the day was a fucking heathen, just a den of heathenry. You'd walk in, I could get Xanax. I could literally just give my coat to the bartender with 60 bucks in one pocket. And when I left that night, there'd be an eighth of weed in there and the 60 bucks would be gone. 
And then, like, you could just get, and there were strippers over here that were definitely hooking on the side. And it was just, you just show up and, like, the world was an oyster, but just nothing was good. When you go home now, what club do you play? I do the, well, Stanford's is closed, but they banned me. Uh, oh, so Stanford's is officially closed. They're well, done. Yeah. The wig is done. The wig is done. Well, well and he's forgotten. the only one left. Check. The, Jeff died. Jack died a few years ago. Craig's, I guess, sick. Stan, the dad, might outlive all three sons. So Craig is the one with the wig. Craig's the one with the wig. Okay, so I never, I did the open mic. I yeah. bombed. I never even dreamed to call them again. I went home and I looked at my guide of comedy clubs and I just slipped an X through that one. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm not ever calling them again. So I got a call one day from Roger Paul. Yeah. And he goes, hey, uh, they want to hire you at Stanford. And I go, are you fucking kidding me? No, you're going to Kansas City. I go, okay, I'll go. Uh, I shit money. Yeah, of course. But, but the first time I went, I'm lying to you. It wasn't through Roger Paul. It was through Bill Burr's management at the time. Agency. This is when I got the longest yard. Oh, okay. They hired me. Okay. And I was horrible. And when I got the radio, the guy said, put your jokes on a piece of paper. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Remember Stanford's had a radio oh, station? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy was a blonde head guy or something. Oh, Johnny Dare. He's still there. Johnny Dare. It's still then, one then, of the worst to do. Oh, my God. And they wrote, they bought like a, a, a comedy they bought club. A, they, they, they went into the like. business together. And right. then that, that dissolved. The rock and roll. It was called Johnny Dare's. Oh, my God. Yeah. Look at that. I still remember that shit. And then like that, that kind of, you know. Craig's not someone you want to go into business with. And Johnny Dare found that out the hard way. So, all right. So the first time I go in, Craig picks me up. <laughs> I don't know who the manager is. I eat shit at the radio. He, we're arguing the whole way to the fucking thing. Yeah. It was five of the roughest days of my life. Dude. I didn't know what I was doing. And I kind of behaved myself. Well, just so people, I just want to throw it out there so people know, when you do that radio show, he just says how you doing. And that's basically your you to do like five minutes of material. material they want you to do your material they went in it's just like but without laughter so like what do you think about minutes. flying yeah and it's just like man can't we just can't can we you just, just read your yeah, news yeah. stories and like i'll make funny comments yeah, and like i'll be yeah. funny and not have to burn 25 <laughs> minutes material but they don't want that they just because you can't do that material that night then right no it's stupid but yeah i do remember what happened now so the first time i went i didn't have any credits and they treated me like shit but the second time I went, I had a bunch of credits. So it was like he he gave me extra money and blah, 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 blah. But I booked Law & Order SVU. So I couldn't do Tuesday night or something. Or I couldn't do Wednesday. So I, I flew in that night. So I land in Kansas City or whatever the fuck you land on Kansas side. I don't know. What you, they, let, you know, way up north on Missouri side. Missouri side. I land there and I get the luggage. It's 10 o'clock at night. There's nobody at the fucking luggage. And all of a sudden, I see a cop lights. And that got nothing to do with me. You know, I got a little weed in my pocket, but ain't no big thing. And next thing you know, a guy comes out. He goes, you Joey Diaz? I go, yeah. He goes, I'm your driver. I'm the manager from Stanford's. Now, he's fucked up. Yeah. His jaw is fucking gone. He's just coked up. He's coked up. And he's like, these cops told me, do you have your license with you? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, tell him that you're driving. So well, is I this Ron? He, he went to open up a club in Toledo, Ohio. Hey, Ron. Oh, my God. He has a chick in the car, and they're fucked up as shit. I get in the car. I got to make believe I'm that driving. That dude did so much cocaine, he got fat. Like, he went, he got he got skinny. He got coke skinny. And then he did so much cocaine, he went the other side, and it bloated him. Now, where is he now? I don't know. I heard not good things. Not good things. No, not he was good. a mess. That night, he was jawing. The chick's jawing. So I'm in the car, and I'm like, how you guys doing? Now I'm a coke fiend. Yeah. I'm getting off a plane. I haven't done coke in two nights. And I'm like, how you guys doing? <laughs> yeah. Like, Great. Now, you look like now, just the people I've been looking for. And I'm like, well, you got any more of that shit? And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I'm like, any more of that shit? And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. I go, and I stop the car. I go, I will get that fucking cop right in the air right fucking now. Yeah. Where can we get a gram of fucking coke tonight after you put me? Oh, we're just messing with you. 
We got it on us. We'll weigh it out for you. And he gave me a gram of Coke. He told me not to tell the staff. <laughs> then the next night, he told me not to give one of the waitresses Coke, that she goes crazy. Well, that's the first waitress I gave Coke to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was a beautiful young girl. I just went, and she followed me around all night because she had a kid. She was hot, and she couldn't afford the Coke. And then she came back to the hotel room with me. We did a thousand dirty things. It was horrible. It was fucking horrible. For In the best nights. way. Oh, yeah. Like, he told me, don't give a Coke. I'll never forget she was dry humping the chair one night. It was just crazy. It was just a week of what he's saying. Yeah. Pills. It was just mockery. There was maybe two or three uh, clubs in, in the circuit that were drug infested. That was one of them that I went three times and all three times. I got fucked up every fucking just night. Just nonsense. I remember there was a dude that had a limo service and he ran the limos for for Stanford's. But he, you know, he had other businesses. But... He was like, man, if you just give my driver 40 bucks, I'll have him come get you at the airport. So I flew in from New York. Uh, I just happened to get stopped by the DEA. This is before 9-11. But these guys come up to me. I guess also my parents had upgraded me uh, as a birthday present. So I, I'm a fucking 20-year-old kid that's showing up in first class. Maybe I was 21 because I was hammered. And I so... The three DE agents stop me, pull out their badges. They're like, yo, we want to go through your luggage. And I'm just drunk enough. Also, I have a pipe. I have a weed pipe, and I'm probably half a bar of Xanax and not a, I, I, a dust of weed, probably. And, uh, But I'm still freaking out. I'm a kid from Kansas. I'm at an airport. And I'm, I'm like, no, man. Like, you can't just stop me. This, again, this is pre-9. I was like, you can't just stop me. It's like, I'm, I'm just walking down the street. You can't just stop me. And, and he was like, well, we can search your bag because you're in an airport. And finally, I just gave them the bag and to search. They had a dog come in and search it. And he didn't hit it. They let me go. I take the limo. I go, and you know, you're 21. I have a limo. I go home and I go straight to the club. Well, the limo driver had already called the club and been like, Porter got stopped by the DEA. Everybody assumes I got weed on me. So they think they think I'm going to jail. I walked in. They, people thought they saw a ghost. They're like, what the fuck are you doing here? I was like, I just, I got away. They, they didn't bust me. And they're like, oh, well, welcome. Let me buy you a beer. Is that all there is to do? Because, I mean, so when you guys first started touring, you guys both seemed to like to party a little bit. Was there a time when you wouldn't do anything because you're like, oh, I don't want to make the wrong impression or just like, fuck it? Well, you're a feature nah. act. You go. You're I think, no, I can remember one time me and my buddy Brett Clausen, God rest his soul, uh, we would go to the Cleveland Improv. We would have our two drinks and come back to the condo where it was stocked with liquor and beer and we would just get shit faced. But uh, I. The old Cleveland Improv. The old Cleveland Improv. By the flats. The, yeah, and on the, the other side. And the condo was across the street from a bar. Yeah, the you anchor know, bar. Let me tell you something. The last time I was there was not a good week either. <laughs> the last time I was there was the first season of The Sopranos. And I went there on a Wednesday night and I did coke every fucking night <laughs> till Sunday morning till I left. I even got on the plane and whacked. Like, yeah. The last two nights I didn't sleep at all. They had the strip club across the street, filthy strip club where they gave you lunch. I never, I never went to that. that I'm not rib. a strip club guy. No, me neither. But they, when you got to the, in those days, this is '98. Yeah. The first time I went to the Cleveland Improv was '98. Sarah Nye. See, the I, China, I the remember Chinese Sarah. chick that was banging. Yeah. She used to book it, and she had an assistant, and she was powerful. She was very powerful she on was... the Improv chain. She booked Buffalo, Miami, yeah, and Cleveland, and she, she was kind of a, a witch of a woman. You definitely didn't want to make her mad. No, you didn't want to make her mad, and she got mad for any fucking reason. I remember one time I booked a commercial. I had to cancel Buffalo, and she goes, what else do you have with me? I go, Cleveland, Miami. She goes, take it off the books. Yeah. Next time, don't book a commercial. I almost fucking cried. Fuck. Yeah, she was a fucking real bitch. <laughs> and then she had to book me in Miami, and then she quit. Yeah. She quit. She she she. Some people just can't handle I mean, that's a stressful game. That's a stressful game. Yeah. You know, she used to date how they got into comedy was her, Alex Raimundo, and Ron White. They all knew each other. When okay. Ron White was on the podcast, we spoke about her. She used to date Alex Raimundo. 
Oh, really? That's how she got to the Cleveland Improv. She was like a waitress in Texas, and then something just fucking crazy. Like some crazy story. And she became one of the most powerful chicks at the Improv. Then she yeah. quit in the middle. Dave Becky was a fucking bouncer in at the Improv. Tempe. Yeah. Yeah. Could you imagine being some headliner that was a dick to Dave Becky? And now you're just fucking in Hollywood hell. Like you're never getting out because you said some bullshit to some bouncer. It's 30 years ago. There were so many people who abused. Like, you know, I laugh at the Harvey Weinsteins. There were so many fucking people who abused their power as comedy bookers when you were young. Yeah. They're such dicks to you. But then again, I was blessed with some great guys that I'll never, ever. Like I was talking about Andy Payton. There was this other guy, I can't remember what his name was. What's a political comic? Old Bill? guy. Old, oh. old. Bill Bauer. Fuck. Bill bro. Bauer. That's a deep well, pull. Well, he had, his name was Bill Bauer also, but he was a motorcycle mechanic. He worked on a motorcycle place in Greeley, Colorado, and he booked 20 rooms. You, you know how many times I called that guy for rent in advance? <laughs> And we go, like, Bill, like, I can't pay August rent. Yeah. It's the fucking sixth. Can you give me $400 and book me? And he would go, drive up, I'll give it to you. And I got dates for you. And he would give me the dates to work it off. Dude, I had the exact opposite. Because I came up in the Craig Glazer camp. I remember that dude pulling dates. I'd have a date booked for months. And then the week before, it'd be the last week of the month. It'd be the 26th through the 28th. And he'd pull that shit. I remember one time he pulled that shit because the headliner didn't want to follow me. He was a local headliner. A guy that got a TV show for six weeks, moved out here, spent all his money, moved back, never did shit ever again. What's his name? <laughs> uh, his name's... No, no, no. His name's Steve. And uh, Steve fucking didn't want to follow me. So he went and complained to Craig. Craig called me and he literally said... Uh, I don't want to hear Steve bitch all weekend, so I'm gonna cancel you. I was like, bro, last week of the month, this is my this is literally my rent check that you're taking away from me. And he's like, take it up with Steve. So I had to call Steve, and luckily I'd been on the road enough to where I knew enough bookers to where I had enough I had some leverage. And I was like, yo, dude, I've never really asked any booker to do anything for me, so I have some. I'm just saying, if you pull this week from me, I will call every booker I know and just tell them you're a garbage person. And no matter how funny you might be, you're probably not the kind of person you want to get booked. And uh, and that is the only reason I got to pay rent that month was because that motherfucker was like, okay, you can work for me just because I, th I had to threaten basically his work. But that... but. But that was all Craig. Craig just didn't want to deal with it. Do you remember a couple of years ago, Madonna, about 10 years ago, Madonna had a fucking auction for charity of all the people who turned it down? Uh-uh. Rejection letters? Rejection letters. And no. she read them out loud. And people were running to the fucking hills. Like, she just embarrassed, like, 30 fucking people. Or huge today. Yeah. That had the opportunity to sign Madonna. It's so weird how... You just did something that I wouldn't do either. I just asked you. I just didn't know if you liked the guy or not. But I know 10 motherfuckers today that would complain at a club when they knew they had to follow me, dog. I know, I know, I know like four people. And I forget with them over the years because I get it. But, oh, my God, there was one guy that even the club owner one night sat him down and said, look, here's the deal. It's Thursday. You don't want them to improvise. You don't want them to talk to the audience. You don't want them to work dirty. You got mad at him for work saying that joke. What can he do? Why did you take the fucking job? Oh, it was great. Yeah. This club owner like went off on the headline, who later on went on uh, last comic standing, got a little re revitalization in his career, but he's a fucking bum as far as I'm concerned because <laughs> he just couldn't follow me. At two different clubs. At the, fir the first week, he didn't bitch. Yeah. But the second week, he had a little leverage at, so he bitched. And it didn't. It did to no avail. The audience was digging me, and I knew. I know. I know a guy that pulled a fucking gig from me one time. That's still working. And when I see him now, though, he looks the other way, and I would never hold it against it. 
I get it, but it's not something I would do. No. If I can't follow the feature, I'd just say it. Yeah. I'd just say it. Listen, I can't follow the feature, but why let your ego? I've seen it, and it's fucking horrible when they go crazy. Like, like I, I don't want to. And I get it. I get it. I get it in some situations. Like, if you're showcasing for HBO at the store, I don't want the guy in front of me to go up there and be fucking Johnny Creative with sparklers and shit. Yeah. Because you always hear how when they went to see, they went to see Chris Tucker for uh, American History X and ended up giving it to Joe Torre instead. Guy Torre. Guy Torre. And then they went to see somebody else for the Bruce Willis movie and they fell in love with Chris Tucker. Yeah. That fifth dimension. So oh, you okay. hear about all these stories. Like they go in the store to look at Lee for a Bruce Willis movie. All of a sudden, they hire Chris Tucker. You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> they were looking for a Jew and they hire a black guy. Yeah. How did that happen? Like, and I used to yell at your manager, why would you put a black guy up in front of me? That's fucking funny. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> said, why would you do something like that? Oh, Dude, yeah. This is the shot of my life. Dude, what, before I got any kind of TV credits and you're, you, you were there where you're like, you should be headlining, but you don't have the credits. Right, and, and you're, you're not going to fill seats. Up. So you do like, you'll do like the headline Wednesday, and then you'll open for like John Witherspoon Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Because no matter how well you did, all he had to do is go up there and do his five lines from Friday, which I've never seen anyone handle that shit better than John Witherspoon. He goes up on stage, does every line from every movie you want to fucking hear. No context. He just rattles them off. Like, here the fuck they are. And then he just goes right into 55 minutes of really good comedy that has nothing to do with that shit. And so, but like, once he does that shit, it doesn't matter what the fuck you're doing. So like, when I was in that level, like, that's what I'm saying. It's just like, you have to get to that level, you know? That level's a shitty level. Dude. It's a shitty level. So now you're funny. Yeah. So now you've done everything. You've done everything. You're but you, funny. You're you just, fucking great. You know how to write. You've been doing comedy for 11 years. You're ripping rooms a fucking part. Like yeah. fucking ripping assholes apart. But but Wednesday shows up and there's 35 fucking minutes. Not when, even. That's when you learn that it's a business. It's a business. And you have and people have to know who the fuck you are. And then a guy comes in that puts a wig on and does impersonations and there's a line around the corner. Yeah. And you're like. Oh, yeah. What am I doing wrong? I had to follow a dude at the improv the other night that could do, he could beatbox while singing fucking bass lines, and then he could sing like a fucking bird, and then he would crush it. He would sing every hot song that you've ever known from, and he was that guy that was like, oh, you like this song, and he would sing like the newest, hottest song, and they'd be like, here's my song, and he would sing like the older song, and it was fun. I found myself like in the back just like, yeah, get it, it's fun. And I'm like, who's the dumb motherfucker who's got to so follow this dude? Oh, fuck, it's me. And it's like, how? what the fuck am I supposed to do? And literally the only way I could follow him was to go on stage and go, why the fuck do I have to follow that? Like, I thought we were just using words. And this, this dude's coming up and doing all this shit. There's crazy comics who will go up there and mix comedy with music. And destroy a room. Dude, when it's done well, it's oh, really it's effective. Really, it's effective as fuck. There used to be a black guy in this town called James Stevens III. We met, he was from Seattle, Washington. Me and Josh Wolf had the pleasure of opening for him. And he was like a big timer up in Seattle. He's that comic that came down and made it. So when he came back, he rented like a fucking Porsche at the airport. And he took us to strip clubs and everybody <laughs> knew him. And, he was on the Stephanie Miller show at the time. It was on ABC. It was on after Politically Correct. Like, if you stay up till 1 in the morning. But people, were, he was still selling tickets. Like, he was a local favorite. But he was a regular at the store. And he would level yeah. the store. But the black guys did not like him. <laughs> 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 the other black guys just fucking hated him. But here's the thing about that stuff. It's like, when it works, oh. it's amazing. When it doesn't work, it's an hour of the most excruciating shit you've ever done. Like, it's not like, there are a few of those guys that can put the guitar down and do stand-up. I'd say maybe three or four. But for the most of them, if the guitar shit ain't working, 
or the musical shit ain't They're working. Done. They're done. They're done. But not only that, they got no way to, like, if you and I get up there and say we're yelling too much or we're talking too fast or something, we can, we can readjust in the middle of a set because we're being real. We're true to ourselves, I would say. Not that guitar acts aren't, but that's definitely a character. And, but you and I are able to be like, all right, you guys need to, you guys are tired of me yelling at you. So I'm going to chill the fuck out. And maybe we're just going to talk in this moniker. And that meanwhile, a guitar act, it's like, what are you supposed to do? It's like, this shit ain't working. Maybe do some more Van Morrison or something. Like, what, what do you do at that point? I have seen shit that, like that, James Stevens III, I saw him blow up the Melrose Improv one night. Like, just standing ovation, huge. And then one night, like, I, I became friends with him. And he would come to the store and do spots, you know, like Paul Mooney and everybody else. And one night, he went up there and leveled the fucking room. Like, on a Thursday night, there was, like, 80 people in there. And Eddie Griffin had a follow. And Eddie Griffin goes, let's keep it going. And Eddie Griffin, his name was James Stevens the third. But Eddie Griffin and the rest of the black guys, because he was black, they would call him James. Let's keep it going. James Stevens the turd. <laughs> right to his fucking face, they would say it. And Eddie Griffin was ruthless at that time. Yeah, yeah. Ruthless. And he went up there and he's like, let's keep it going for James Stevens the third. I don't think that nigga saw the sign on the motherfucking store. It's the comedy store, not the goddamn music store. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Me sitting back there going, oh, oh shit. <laughs> Eddie Griffin's not fucking around. Let's keep it going for James Stevens the third. I guess nobody told this motherfucker that this wasn't the fucking music store. This was the motherfucking comedy store. It's so funny to see comics react to it because to me like it doesn't bother me that much but i, I used to it will when you it have to like, follow it and you're on the road oh. and you're fucking dying all week and you see this guy that is singing springsteen songs from the yeah. 80s did you ever see heath heitch oh yeah of course brilliant 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 heath heitch would go on stage with four people attached to his back bro what like puppets, puppets. Oh, okay. <laughs> not like actual four people. black people and he'd be a preacher and bro, it sounded like you want a fucking chorus. He was brilliant. Try following that. Like, I had to follow him one night in the original room. I followed a magician last night. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a slow death, too. Because magicians just piss, just piss people off. It just makes me laugh. Like, eight I like minutes of, you eight, hate it. Ten minutes of magic is the most people can tolerate. Yeah. After ten minutes, people are like, oh, okay. They start getting <laughs> fucking creepy. They start moving around. <laughs> yeah. And then you got to follow. What was the Kozak? Oh, you want to hear a story about Kozak? Hit me with Kozak. I got a a great Kozak story. So. What year? This is probably 010. Okay. What the fuck? All right. So. uh, Did you, you heard that, right? Yeah, the snack truck. The fucking, oh, the La Cucaracha. That's Ralphie Mae. That's Ralphie Mae. Pick up a pie up. But I'm also fucking from like, I I grew up in the 80s where that was just some dude's car. Right. They they just reached (laughs) under the dash and that was her horn. But, uh. So I'm doing the trop in Atlantic City. And uh, me and uh, this feature act, Joe, I can't remember his last <laughs> name. Anyway, Kozak's doing every night, 6 p.m. show. Sunday, we go see him. It's us, a large Jewish family. I'm talking full-on black uh, black pants, white shirt, yarmulkes, all of them. Uh, there's another couple, and then there's us. It's a light crowd. He's doing jokes. It's like a family-friendly show. He's doing jokes about ex-wives and boners and shit. And so I leave. Like, it's a fun show. But it's like, there are definitely times where you're like, bro, there are fucking kids in the room. And so I tweet, uh, uh, just saw uh, Kozak, the completely inappropriate family-friendly magician. I get a, I fly home. I get a call from the owner of the trap who I hadn't met. I'd talked to for like two seconds on the radio or on the tele, uh, telephone, fly home, take a nap, wake up to a phone call from him. Like, yo, Kozak's mad at you. And I call, so you have to call it. So I call Kozak and I'm like, what's up? And he was like, yo, I heard about your tweet. Uh, I think you're going to damage my attendance. I got 2000 followers at the time, right? I go, let's break down the numbers here. Kozak. 
I got 2,000 followers at best. 10% of them are in the Northeast, New Jersey. I go high end. I got 100 followers in the New Jersey area. Of those people, how many are in Atlantic City? Maybe 12. So maybe four people didn't come to you. And I, if they're my followers, they're probably going to come to your show because I tweeted that shit. And he was like, you don't know the power that you have. I was like, I have no power, bro. I got 2,000 followers. And I, I just had a, it. Was a, it, it was just an arguing with like a person you're not. Was he drinking at the time? I don't fucking know. No, because he was big. Like, I worked on New Year's of 2000, though. Yeah. 2K, when the world was going to end, in El Paso. <laughs> he was the headliner. And I had just heard all these stories about him. He came down, and it was just fucking nuts. Like, he had a, a part of his contract was he has his own, own bottle of booze every night. No. Like a certain. Your own bottle. Like a certain booze that was his. It came yeah. in like a sack. Oh, Crown Royal? Something like that. Like yeah. He would just drink Crown Royal, came in a sack, and. So we, it was Tuesday through Sunday, and New Year's being a Saturday night and Sunday or Friday night, something like that. And so you had to do a show New Year's Day? He did a, a comedy show for kids. Oh, okay. But this is when he was getting fucked up. He was getting fucking hammered <laughs> in those days. He was drinking a bottle of that shit every night, doing blow, yeah, smoking cigarettes. I'm doing blow, too. You know, I'm not doing it with him. I go back to the condo on New, New Year's Eve and El Paso that year was just fucking crazy. I met a waitress, and next thing you know, we're having sex in the back. And next thing you know, she's out getting drunk. And another comic is going behind my back, swapping spit with her. And I just came in the mouth, and they're about an ATM machine. I mean, this is, this is just crazy. It was just fucking crazy. And I left with another girl. It was fucking crazy, New Year's Eve. And I wake up New Year's morning, and the show starts at like 1. It's like an afternoon show, 2 o'clock. It's 9 in the morning. Kozak already has his fucking magician shirt on, ironed. Boxer shorts, the old man socks rolled up to his knees, yeah. the shoes <laughs> and the suspenders on. And he's just sitting there with, with uh, half a gallon of that gallo wine. Oh. That shit, like that shit, drinking yeah. it. Yeah, that's like five bucks for a handle. Yeah, like or he's whatever. drinking that shit. It's nine in the morning, he's watching college football. And again, I'm like, dog, it's a bit early for this. He's got a couple lines on the table. So when he goes, I'm going to do the kid show. You know me, dog. I know what entertainment is. I follow him. Oh, you I, weren't on the show? No, no, no. It's a kid show. It's okay. him as a magician. Yeah. And I walk in, and I can see Bart look at him, and it's like, Jesus Christ, you reek of alcohol. You know, like, he just, he's doing a kid show. And he's reeking out alcohol. The kids are walking. He's at the bar <laughs> drinking shots and shit. Finally, he goes on stage, and he's fucked up. And finally, some kid looks at him and goes, Ew, you smell, <laughs> right? I mean, just, I mean, you know, and I'm in the back howling because I know yeah. this shit. And at that time, they had a, the MC was a little Mexican dude. And the reason why Bart hired him was he cleaned the movie theater and he cleaned the comedy club. So Bart, <laughs> so Bart... Made them, you know, the guy wanted to be a comic, and we would torment them. The, the word on the street was, whenever you gave him uh, your intro, it was like six pages, like write it out. And he would go on stage and, like, uh, this next comic went to Catholic school. <laughs> He's from Kansas City, Missouri. He hysterical. Yeah. So we fucking he was the janitor at night. So after the comedy club would close, like all night long, he would say, "Hey." Pick that straw up, you know, because he'd have to fucking, like, from the stage, he would yell at people, hey, pick that yeah, straw yeah. up. Because that was to, one more straw he didn't have to pick He up. would have to come back that night and do it. So one night, he begged us. <sighs> he goes, just from my years of experience, Bart, you, you're not going to throw graffiti around tonight, are you? Know, confetti, graffiti. Yeah. Oh. And he goes, because you have to pick it up one piece at a time. <laughs> and that's all I needed to hear. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I went out and bought confetti just no, down front. Uh, I was going to make a joke that you yes, did that. No, I, you didn't. Yes, I did, dog. Oh. And I, when they said Happy New Year, I started throwing confetti everywhere. The next day... He went there at 2 in the morning, and the next day at 5 in the afternoon, him and his wife were still on their hands and knees, oh, picking up confetti. <laughs> I would just quit. Oh, my so, God. So, yeah, he comes off stage, and he goes right to the bar. And people weren't taking pictures with you then. They just wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And he went right to the bar and started drinking. And then people would come over, and the kids would do, do a magic trick. And he was smoking a cigarette. And he'd have like a fucking 
shot glass in his hand and Bart had to say something like they're talking to kids. Put the fucking cigarette away. I mean, there's more to the story. <laughs> yeah. But I know I forgot it. It was fucking <laughs> hilarious. He did something. Like the pigeon disappeared. Oh, yeah. The pigeon wouldn't fly out of the hat. <laughs> it was like fucking something just crazy. Let me give some shout outs. That's crazy. Robert Siriano, happy birthday. Ben McClure, Brady McConaughey, Ryan, Rasta Jeff, Quadrex, Meg, my girl, the Omaha fucking charts. Barry O'Sullivan and the true NJI or whatever the fuck. Don't forget this Thursday, I'll be at the Kansas City Improv. And then uh, at the end of the month, I'll be at Nashville and then Alabama. We'll get to that shit later. But this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's hysterical. Friday night, I got like 100 tickets sold because Rogan's in town. And now that Rogan's really going to sell because they're going to boycott his show. The Christian Baptist whatever is going to Westboro fuck. Baptist Church. Yeah, Westboro. No way. Yeah, they're doing down there. So now I'm really doomed. Nobody's coming to my show. Uh -huh. I gotta say some shit about the West Barrow Valley Church. They come down and ban me and call me a heathen. See? They got a lot of people, man. They could send a couple people down to your show. What the fuck just is A couple of rooks. Yeah. Just a couple of new guys. Send them down to the Joey Diaz show. <laughs> so you're shooting a special. Yeah. You're shooting independently for a great company. I spank. In fact, he called me till they fucked nuts. <laughs> uh, Brian. Brian. Yeah. yeah. He called me till I, I gotta shake him down. He doesn't know. I know this fucking FBI dude. That's an FBI auditor that took down the Bananos. Okay. And for $5,000, he'll go into your business and find out if you're robbing from me. And if he catches you, he'll report you to the FBI. That's a civic duty. So you're fucked double time. <laughs> I just don't want to put him up Brian's ass because I'll be a fucking, don't help me. You'll be a marked man. Although oh, hate me in the comedy world yeah, if yeah. I get that guy with Brian's ass. But it's, uh, it's a civic duty. <laughs> it's a civic duty. Well, how, what number special is this for you? Well, I guess technically three because I did one. I did a self-produced one right after last comic, and then Stand Up Records picked that up. So that's out there. That's called Screaming from the Cosmos. Okay. Then I did Ugly and Angry for the same company, and then uh, this will be three. Yeah. Three. And then I put another album out in between Ugly and Angry and this one. You like doing the albums or the specials? Uh, I'd rather do the specials. They're more effective. You know, all that shit's just uh, advertisement for the gigs, you know. But, uh, yeah, the specials are, obviously, they add a whole nother element. You can make faces and your jokes can be silent if necessary. When you're doing, if you're just doing a record, you have to, sometimes you got to rewrite some shit because you're doing a visual joke that's not going to transfer over Spotify. I like records. I grew up listening, so I like the, the gift of listening. Yeah. And now it's just so many fucking specials that you don't have time to. Well, I always put my special out on record, like actual vinyl. Really? Yeah, I got like Ugly and Angry's on vinyl, uh, and uh, and and Lost and Alone are both out on vinyl. There's something burning over there. Something yeah. smells like oh, you're burning. Right. I'm burning. <laughs> I smell something. Like, I smell fucking fire from somewhere. <laughs> So you shoot this August 17th. August 17th, got A week the from this Friday. A week from this theater. Friday, yeah. Denver, fucking Colorado. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, you know, Denver's been a good hang for me for a lot of years. I've uh, I've done a lot of good shows there, and then uh, I've spent a lot of time with uh, my friends' bands there, just hanging out. And so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's definitely going to be a very compassionate scene. What year were you on Last Comic Stand? 2006. Jesus Christ. Yeah, man. It just keeps getting further and further away. But I'm fine with it. Like, I, it's... I'd I'd be fine if that's the last thing people remembered me for. What season did you do? Two? Four. Four. Yeah, the, the first year it came back. Because three got canceled like two weeks before Alonzo won. And then who were you on last comic with? Josh Blue, Gabriel Iglesias, uh, Ty Barnett finished second. Ty Barnett. Is he still around? He's around. He disappeared for a little bit, but he's back. I've seen him quite a bit. So, But I think I think uh, he had some family issues to attend to. So. Ty Barnett, Gabriel. Yeah. That's quite a lineup. It's crazy when you look at like the old San Francisco lineups. Yeah. Like from 
90 and go, wow. Oh, yeah, just Pat Oswald and Dana Gould and just all these fucking heavy hitters. I remember there was a guy that took third in San Francisco one year. Carlton Richardson from Dallas, Texas or something. Yeah. And I remember I saw him in Dallas once. He was lonely. And I went up to him. I'm like, bro, you took third in San Francisco. Why are you so quiet? And he's like, oh, my life didn't really, yeah. nothing really happened. And it's so weird how your expectations are for different things as a comic. And when something well, doesn't happen. But you know what, Chris? The only expectation we have is to be funny. And sometimes we forget that. Well, I mean, there's other things. I mean, those people thought just just being funny would make it, but they. You also have to move to somewhere where people give a shit, and I think that's where that moves hard to make for some people. Like as easy it was for me or other people, and it wasn't easy for me. Like I cried the first three hours of my drive out to Los Angeles, but like that. And I remember coming home and people being like, how'd you move to L.A.? And it's like, you put your shit in your car, you drive, you stop, you take your shit out, you sign a new lease. Like It's not hard, but for some people it's hard because you're leaving everything you've ever known for a whole new scene. And, and some people, they keep putting it off because they think, oh, I'll do it next year, I'll do it next year, because they're waiting for the perfect moment to leave. But there's never a perfect moment. There's never moment. a perfect moment. There's just the moment. And so one moment you have to take it and you have to put all your shit in your car and you have to get in your car and you have to go. Do you some of driving into this fucking hellhole what you felt like? Oh, yeah. I, I was so excited. You're I remember. Excited, scared. It's, it's not just because I was excited, scared, curious. Yeah. I was 18 different emotions. When I first saw that Hollywood sign, like the 101 South, we came from Seattle. Like I was scared, like everything came to fruition. Like I was scared, I was excited, I was curious. I wanted to see if things would pan out. I wanted just to, I was so, like there was a rainbow of emotions, you know. I don't know how it is for other people. When you were excited, you had already done last comic? No, I got it eight months later. Moved out here. I got it eight. But I'll tell you what. I drove into town. It took me two days to get into town. I got into town. I stayed with Emery Emery the first two nights I, or first two months I lived here. Emery Emery edited the Aristocrats DVD and I think the movie for uh, Paul and Penn. So when I showed up, Literally, moment one, I walked into Emery's apartment. Paul Provenz is in there. They're editing this movie for DVD. And I just, I remember sitting down and being like, I'm here now. And I'm already in it. Like, I'm already, I'm already in the middle of an editing process. So I was like, I knew I'd made. Also, I had, uh, I remember I'd gone to Minnesota with my uncle the weekend before to his cabin. And we were hanging out and I'm not kidding you planes had crossed and left contrails and it said LA in the sky so I, I knew I was set I just knew I I had literally seen it in the sky so I was fine if you could do something differently what would you have done differently uh, I would have used the money I made in last comic standing a little more wisely I had a lot of fun with it uh, I was told by a friend, he was like, uh, he's like, you you know what it's like to live poor, have fun living rich. So I, I spent my money. I would come into town. And I remember going to Kansas City and renting a suite at the nicest hotel in town and hanging out and doing mushrooms with my friends. And the, the security guards coming in and laughing because it reeked like weed, but they didn't care because, again, I was in a suite in the nicest hotel in town. So they were just like, yeah, you're fine. First off, the money didn't come with handles on it. No. Number two, you earned it. Yeah. Number three, you were young. Uh, you didn't know. You know. But I also didn't make enough money to buy a house no, either. No, you didn't make it. No, no, no. It was no big deal. Like, you know, the, the, the main thing of this whole thing is loving what you do. Yeah. Like, it's so fucking weird that we, we're lucky. We're very lucky. No matter how 
the stories, the horror shit of being on a Greyhound bus or getting bumped a week of rent. These are all what get your skin thick yeah. for today. What you go through today. What do you think today? The, the, people think that oh, Joey just walks in. No. It's a complete different aggravation. We're talking about, how about, we're talking about people like Theo Vaughn and Dean Delray and Kate Quigley that are in that hell. They could headline, they could sell 60 tickets. Yeah. But they could still feature. And they could, st- you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like that's a weird place to be after you already paid your dues. Yeah. You're always in a weird place. You're never at that place where you want to be. That's what makes this journey fucking just, just undeniable. Like, I, would you do it again? Yeah, I'd do all of it. Everything. I do everything way. all. Starve. Yeah. Not have money. All of it. Flat tires. And the starving times were the best times. The best times. That's what people do not. They do not see them. A person goes, I cannot. I don't understand how that is fun. Dude, it, I remember the days where I knew I had to make $25 because that was enough time to feed myself twice, buy myself a pack of cigarettes, and enough to like buy. If I saved enough of it for over three days, I'd buy me another eighth of weed. And that, that's how I survived until I made the next rent check. You know, I just, and that, those were the best times of my life. Just like literally just hanging out with my friends because there was nothing else we could fucking do and writing jokes and, and dreaming about these times. Bro, when I bought a pack of joints today, do you know how many times we dreamed about that in Kansas City as we were rolling one and smoking a fucking cigarette going, man, I can't, someday you're going to be able to buy a pack of joints. You can't do it in Kansas City, but I you, I can do it. Like just just shit like that, it just fucking amazes me. The where I've come from, but you know I was again I was with my buddy Justin Leon who I've known literally since I've started, and we we just sat back, and the greatest memories that we talked about were the memories from those initial years, those three those years from one to four, where you're. You're just doing it for the love of it. Like you, you got day jobs. You're just, or you're just struggling, or you're, you're at that place where you're doing maybe a week a month or two weeks a month, like enough for where you can't hold a regular job, but you can barely make rent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it, a tough spot to be at. That's a tough either. spot to be at. Yeah. But it's also it's the best spot because you come home and you're like, well, fuck it, I'm probably not gonna make rent anyway, so let's go to the boats. And you go to the casino and you just hope and you end up losing fifty bucks, but it doesn't fucking matter. Because at the end of the you know, it all fucking worked out somehow. It really does. It really does. It really does when you put your trust in you and your heart into something. You, and yeah. all of a sudden you go, fuck it. I'm going to blow this last 50. Something's going to happen. Yeah. And something always You happens. owe somebody 300 you only got 75 in the bank. You might as well have fun with the 75. At least you had a good time with it. Do you, do you think that's, I mean... Do you think you got taken advantage of at the beginning, or maybe not at the beginning, no, but because no. of your love for it, you, no, you do stuff that you're not supposed to do? No, no you, you're you, just terrible. You're not taken advantage of. You, this is what you have to do. Yeah. This is what you have to do. Not everybody's going to give you 50 bucks. Not everybody's going to give you 100 bucks. But no. they're going to give you a stage and a mic and an yeah, opportunity right. to no, do no, I'm, I'm at the point where I, I'm happy just to do it, but maybe it's at the 10-year mark. Because I... I don't know. I would get. They but, always take advantage of. until you get a movie. Yeah, you get fucked in the ass. Until you get <laughs> the opportunity, you get fucked in the ass. You ever go? You ever go to a club, and they look at you and they go like, "Well, we're gonna pay you eight hundred. That's the most we can pay you." Yeah. And ten years later, you go in there and they're giving you twenty thousand, and you're like, "Yeah, I think only gonna give me eight hundred. <laughs> yeah, there was literally the same amount yeah, of people. It's the same amount of people. Yeah. Right. So it's 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 you're always gonna get fucked, and that's part of it. That's and, part until of it. the like, unless you got leverage. You're getting fucked. But you wouldn't do, I don't think you would do the spot if you didn't love it. Like if it was just no, a job. No, you're not looking at it like that. Right. That's you're not right. looking at it like that at all. You're looking at an opportunity to get funnier. Exactly. That's all you're thinking about. You got to cover your ass some way or another. I remember hosting on the road. Hosting. Making 150 bucks for the weekend. For the weekend. And, the, and then, you know, that you if you broke even, you were happy because I live with my folks. And as long as I could come home, they'd feed me. I didn't obviously didn't have rent to pay at that time. But yeah, I mean, it was, I remember being in Wichita, Kansas, was living in the condo. I got there a day early. The comics from the last week were still there. And I just thought it was the coolest shit in the world. 
Like I thought it was the great. If you put me in a condo now, I'd fucking lose. I'd rage flip a table. But at in that moment, I was like, if also if I break even, this is going to be a great weekend. All I got to do is break even. If I have twenty five bucks to get me gas home, then everything is gravy. I'm going to tell you, comic something. Don't listen. I'm going to tell Lee something that you should get out of your head right now. When I got into comedy, when I got into comedy, the day I said to myself, it was like 94, I had been doing comedy three years, and I go, this is it. Like, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I knew that it was going to be 10 years till I saw money, and I knew it was going to be a struggle, and that's why I started shaving away at things. Yeah. I forced myself, I knew that I had to make a decision in a year. I, I knew in Boulder that <laughs> this ain't gonna work no more. Just delivering Chinese food, slinging coke. Yeah. Just doing comedy part time, one month, one week here. What? This is not gonna work. I gotta dive into this. So I started watching less TV. I started forcing myself. It's depending how how do you live broke? Well, you, you gotta get a tent. Yep. You gotta get blankets, a sleeping bag. And I never forget to get doing that first dribble run, like two weeks back to back, and you get a flat tire, and and these are all things that are not included in your budget. Yeah, they're not included in your budget. All the most terrible things happen when you're first starting. Yeah, all those things that your car, the lease, the whole, all that your car blows up. When you can absolutely afford it, you're fine. You're fine. That shit never happens. It's the week when you go and then you run over a deer and a deer's leg is the only could happen to you. I still remember the time <laughs> Ralphie went somewhere they gave him 500 bucks and on the way up the elevator the keys fell out of his finger and they went in the shaft. Uh, and he had to stay in the hotel an extra day and the guy could only come on Monday morning and he it was $480. He came back from Sacramento with $20 yeah. for the week because the keys fell down the elevator shaft. And they couldn't get somebody there till Monday fucking morning. Like, what are the chances of that? Like, that's the comedy game. And you just got to, if you can't cry, yeah, you can't say nothing. It's just paying your debt to the universe. I remember playing, it was one of my first headlining gigs. I did Knuckleheads in Mall of America, which is now a Corona bar. And that's, that's the Corona. That's, that's the, the Corona bar when you leave, uh, when you leave the other one. Rick Bronson's. Rick Bronson's. Corona Bar's old knuckleheads. Oh, my God. Right? Okay. So, I do Tuesday through Saturday. Minnesota is six and a half hours from Kansas City. They give me $1,200. I've never seen $1,200 my entire life. I take the check. I'm, la- I'm literally laughing on my drive home. I'm like, what am I going to do with all this money? I'm going to get a website. Like, this is when websites are just brand new. I, I'm going to do all this. I'm going to do this. Like, I'm really going to put it into. I'm an hour outside of Des Moines going through a construction zone and a deer comes out of nowhere. Oh hit it God. straight on. I can remember this decapitated the deer. <laughs> I remember that because I hit the body. The head stayed where it was, spun around a couple times, landed there. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I got a one hitter. I got the little, the little dugout, the little wood dugout, that standard setup. I pulled off. I, I lost a headlight. Like, everything's pretty much fine. The radiator's fine. The fan's fine. I call my dad. I'm just and I'm still speechless. I'm like, it's a fucking deer. It's a fucking. And he's like, what are you talking about? I go, I just made as much money as I've ever made in my entire life, and I just hit a fucking deer. And he's like, well, because my dad knows me. He's like, you need to get rid of whatever you got and just get here. And it literally cost. Everything that I would have put into a website, it was like literally like five hundred, six hundred dollars. Was everything over what I normally make, and that you know is just like that's part of it. It's pain. It's like you said, it's pain your dues. The universe tests you, dude. The moment the universe tests you, as soon as you commit, the universe goes, okay. Let's see how really committed you are to this. And they test your love for what you're doing. Yeah. And it shows you that you really want to do this. You know, I, I remember being in a fucking Riviera one weekend doing a dirty show for Sharippa, opening up for Rogan. Fucking $200 for two shows. 
and the employee. This is at a regular at the comedy store. It's 98. I thought I hit the big time. $200 and a fucking he gave me, he threw the card at me to the employee dining room where the food is already bitten and shit. <laughs> yeah. The chicken. You know, and, and you, you're like, what the fuck? Like, he just insulted me. Like, it was just... But I, I couldn't sleep. I didn't have reefer. At that time, Rogan didn't smoke, so I didn't bring reefer with me, and I couldn't fall asleep. So I went walking around, and I seen Slash. He was there for a, a, a game convention. We saw him on the plane. He was on the Southwest with us and everything from Burbank. And I saw him at the fucking thing that night. I went up to him, and I asked him, I go, why did Guns N' Roses break up, you know? And he was very nice. And he said, he goes, are you broke now? And I go, yeah, because you know, I had known him from Ahmed Ahmed had a room and Slash had gone in there one night. And, you know, I had to go up and say hello or something. And so he knew I was a comic. And when I saw him in Vegas, I told him, and he goes, if you're broke now, he goes, cherish these times because this is what balances you out later. He goes, Axel wasn't balanced out and he couldn't handle the money he made all at once and he lost it this is what keeps you these stories when we share them like this yeah this is the shit that you dig upon when your agent says you know i can't represent you no more because you said shit on that thing and you're like okay who gives a fuck yeah i'll be fine I ate dick in buffalo you know what i'm saying <laughs> i caught the clap in fucking pittsburgh like oh my God. you just you just, all this bad shit that happened to you that at the time you thought was bad but was really a blessing that made you a comic. I rem- all this shit makes you a comic. I remember, I, uh, I had four months, of, uh, four weeks of work in Florida, straight ahead. It was like two weeks in Tampa, a Naples gig, and then maybe Uncle Funnies. It was Uncle Funnies. Davy, Florida. Open, uh, open for Hedberg. As a matter of fact, I'm 17 hours into the trip. I've driven straight. Man, wherever the fuck, George. I pull off because I'm tired. And as soon as I pull off, the car starts shaking. So the car at low revs won't hold up. So I'm literally having to kind of keep it. Like anytime I have to stop, I got to throw it into neutral just so the engine will keep running. So I get into Naples. And I go to a stop sign and I'm putting up into neutral. It's an automatic transmission. So I'm going to throw it up into neutral. It goes into reverse. Fucking shreds the linkage. So now I got to drive it like a, a manual. Like I got to throw it into low. Like you'll hear it in the gear and then two and then drive and then overdrive. I do the whole run. I get the engine service. They're like, your transmission's fucked, but it works the way it is. I have to drive from Tampa, Florida to Kansas City. On this fucking transmission. And the problem is, when I put the cruise control on, anytime the engine goes to automatically shift down, like if you're climbing up a hill, it would shift into neutral. So I had to be aware of that and then click it out of drive, click it down myself, and then keep going for 22 hours. My girlfriend could, my girlfriend at the time was with me. She couldn't do it. I mean, it's, if you don't know any shit about cars, you're not gonna be able to hear that shit. And, uh, I did it. I, I remember I was hallucinating from St. Louis to Kansas City. Just the entire time, if I saw a truck, I would think there were three cars behind it. But meanwhile, I had to ma- I had to mine the transmission. I drove 22 hours straight because I had to open for Larry the Cable Guy for a week straight the next day. And so I got into Kansas City at 6 a.m. on a Tuesday morning after I've driven 22 hours on no sleep, just weed, just, I didn't even drink no, coffee. No doze, no fucking No, I didn't doing, even drink no coffee dose. at the time. I just kept, it was just nothing but pure will. And in, the girlfriend passed out seven hours out. She woke up in St. Louis. She's like, no, I'll be up the whole rest of the time. That girl passed out five minutes in outside of St. Louis and did not wake up till we hit the curb into her house. I drop her off at 6 a.m. I get back on the highway. There's a massive oil spill on I-70, takes me an hour to do what should have taken 20 minutes. And I get home, I woke up eight hours, 12 hours later, showered, 
did a sold out Larry the Cable Guy show. And like literally every month, every dime I made from a month of work went into fixing that transmission. And you fucking no regrets. No regrets. Fuck them all up the ass. Dude. Fuck, fuck them all. That's what we do. This That's is why it. we're here. This is It's so crazy how I see people that think that they're just going to walk up here. And, and I see it. And, you know, I love these guys that I've been doing this for. And it's like, you have no fucking idea. Come back and see me. In 10 years, and we'll talk. You have no fucking idea what you have to go through. Well, it's like these cats that started in L.A. and have been good enough to make it through the ranks, and now they're getting looks, and now they're starting to do the road, and they look at us, and they're like, how do you do the road? I'm like, that's that's the job. That's when it becomes a job. Like, you're out there working. People look at me, and they go, you do 40 weeks a year. How do you do that? I'm like, normal people work 50. Everybody, every blue collar work guy that works gets two weeks of vacation a year. Otherwise, they clock in nine to five every week. Like that's this is what this is our job. We're fortunate enough to be you able do to do forty it. weeks a year. Yeah, I'm gonna do probably end up doing forty two this year. God fucking bless you. But I mean, what else am I gonna do? It's yeah, the you only can't way. Quit I, now. Yeah, no. And also, I'm at a place where if I'm not doing forty weeks a year, I'm not making money. Like if I'm living out here. You know, I'm on the lowest of low when it comes to the totem pole at this moment as far as pay scale. So if I'm not out there every weekend, I can't go out on dates. <laughs> it's you fucking know. rough, man. Yeah. It really is rough. But it's also like, it's not rough. Like, other than the flights? No. It's pretty easy. No. The stand-up you do free. It's the flying. Yeah, it's, it's like when flight. people say that movies, when you do a movie, you don't get paid to act. You get paid to sit around. Absolutely. The acting you do for fucking free. The stand up, once you get there, it's phenomenal. Dude, I, I even like doing there, radio. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Let's I wake love, up. Let's get shit done. I love the whole process of yeah. it. And for a while there, the business area of it fucks with you. And I fell in love with it again. Like I told you, this morning I got up and at 9 01, I called in for spots at the store. I was like, damn, you're onto something, Joey. When yeah. you call at 9, this is what you do, like on a whatever. But August 17th. August 17th. Gotham Theater. Denver. Listen, you know you I love you guys. To, you can go to the my Instagram. It's uh, at I am Chris Porter, and the link's in my bio. Same with my Twitter. I pinned a tweet. Uh, and then, because the tickets are free. You can just click on there, sign up. What it, there's two shows. There's one at 7. There's one at 930. You request tickets. They're going to tell you the week of. I've had a lot of people email be like, they haven't told me. It's like they tell you the week, the week of. of. The week but of. But everyone's going to get in. Right. Okay. So, you so know, I'm where's not, the link? Where can they find it? It's out. It's on the link in my bio and my Instagram at I am Chris Porter. My Twitter is also at I am Chris Porter. And there's a pinned tweet right at the top that's got the link in it. I wish you nothing but luck. You know, I, I'm one of your biggest fans. I know you're one of those guys that fucking destroys every week. And... uh it's just a matter of time, you know. I, I appreciate it, brother. I love you. I'm happy. You know, I called you weeks ago. Yeah, you did. I, come on. I miss you. You're not going to, you, uh, this is what I realized. You was like, you're not going to let me fail. You called me a week. You called me and you're like, we're going to do this. And I was like, great. And then you called me like, we're definitely doing this. And then you even called me yesterday. I was like, it's happening. So. Hey, for me to be a good comic, I have to be a good comic to the other comics. That's what makes you a good comic. So. I'm starting to learn that we're not in the comedy business. We're in the motherfucking karma business. Well, that's right. So uh, thank you very much. I wish you nothing but luck. I will see you in two months, 90 day. Always welcome back here. Oh, thank you, brother. To promote it wherever it gets picked up. And that's it. And I'll see you motherfuckers tomorrow night in Kansas motherfucking city, Missouri, ready to fucking go. I ain't fucking around. Dean Delray flying in from New York. We're going to light that fucking place on fire. As usual, don't forget. If you're looking for supplements, milkshakes, protein shakes, fucking uh, Shroom Tech Sports, Shroom Tech Immune, Alpha Brain, which is one of my favorites. You guys know I live on that shit. Go to Onnit right now. Onnit.com. Listen, they got kettlebells. They got a bunch of stuff. I can't help you with that. But as far as the supplements are concerned, go to Onnit.com and press in. Church. And get 10% off your order delivered right to your fucking door. Also, I love these. I love solojitsu.com. I love the cards. I love the product. Take a look. Just go to their website, solojitsu.com. Take a look. If you like the cards, order them. I think they're great. I think they're great if you travel. You know, I've been, I play them by myself. I try it. I do a couple hip escapes. I do a couple fucking bridges. I do a couple sprawls. I'm an old man, but at least I'm moving. Listen, 
Have a great weekend. I love you, motherfuckers. Thank you for listening to Henry Rollins. Thank you for listening to my man, Chris Porter. Stay safe. Kansas City, I'll see you motherfuckers tomorrow night ready to light that fucking town on fire. Have a great weekend. See you Monday morning.